Amen. Well, I want to start off by this morning by being completely transparent about something that I experience in my life. I'm hoping that you won't judge me because you might uh, share this in common with me. But if I'm totally honest, each and every day I wrestle with the urge to do something, say something, or think something that I know I shouldn't. Right? I, I wrestle with this urge. There's something inside of me that wants to do something, say something, or see something that I know in my right mind I shouldn't want to think or do or say. I face a decision in each one of these moments, right, when I have this, this urge to do that thing. And oftentimes this decision is made very quickly or swiftly. I quickly dismiss it, avoid a potential pitfall, and move on about my day. But other times it's quite the ordeal. In fact, it can be an agonizing decision, somewhat overwhelming even. And it's not that I'm wrestling with the idea of whether something is right or wrong. I've lived long enough to form kind of a code at this point in time where I've pretty much settled that question for most things. But I still have this idea, and it's so hard. Why is it so hard? And how can we win the battle against that part of ourselves that wants to say yes to something that we know we should say no to? If this sounds familiar to you, it's because I believe temptation is the one thing, at least one thing, not, not the only thing, but one thing that every human that's ever walked has in common. We all have this thing inside of us that wants to do things that we know we shouldn't, things that aren't good for us, things that will cause trouble. To be human is to face temptation and to have to deal with temptation. Now, we're not all tempted by the same thing. You're going to be tempted by different things than I am, for sure. But I've never met anyone who can honestly say, listen, I've never faced temptation. Like, literally, I only do what I know I'm supposed to do, and I never want to do anything I know I'm not supposed to do. Like, that's just not common. That's not our experience. The real problem with temptation is that when we give into it, when we end up doing that thing or saying that thing or believing, thinking that thing we, we shouldn't, it ends up leading to bad experiences and often negative consequences for us. It makes our lives worse. And even more so, sometimes it has really negative implications in the lives of some of the people that we love the most. And so it would serve us well to come up with a game plan, to understand how we might better face temptation. How we might look it in the face and say no in the times that we really, at the core of who we are, want to say no. And that's what I'm hoping that these next few weeks will give us, is a game plan. As we look at scripture, as we look at Jesus facing temptation, and come up with a, a game plan and a strategy of our own to win the battle against temptation, to see victory in this area of our life. Because there's one thing that I believe is true when it comes to temptation. Saying no to the things we shouldn't do will make our lives better and better the lives of those that we love. So let's start at the very beginning, right? We all face temptation. This is something we all have in common. And not only do we all face temptation, but unfortunately we've all given in to temptation. Unless you're literally saying you've only done the things that you know are right for you to do, we can all agree on these first two. I think if we, if we, if we agree on the first two, we also agree on number three, and that is our lives will be better if we can figure out how not to give in to temptation. Because giving in to those things that we know we shouldn't do is what brings all those bad consequences about. Now, it's crazy to think about, but in 2022, there's not much that people can agree on. We seemingly disagree about everything. We fight over things. You see it in the news. I think one thing we can agree on is that we all face temptation. This is true for Christians. This is true for people who aren't Christians. This is true for people who have other faiths. This is true for people who don't believe in God whatsoever. In fact, if you don't believe in God whatsoever, I think this is one of the most difficult things to wrestle with because you really have no way to, to understand what is it about us, this problem inside of us, that leads me to want to do things that I know I shouldn't do. Like, Christianity has a very easy response for that. That's our sin nature, right? That's part of our brokenness. But if you don't believe in a higher power of this sense that God has created us for something, there's really no place to put that experience of not dealing with things well when we know we should or shouldn't do them. And of course, the Bible teaches that temptation has been around since the very beginning. In Genesis chapter 3, Genesis the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1 and 2, God tells the story of how everything was created, right? And whether you believe that that was a factual, um, this is exactly how it happened, or it's an allegory that God has used to simply tell the story and show us that he in fact did create everything and that everything was created with a unique plan and a unique purpose, you know that the story in chapter 3 rings true. 
That's where we find the story of Adam and Eve, right? If you remember, Adam and Eve are the first two humans created in this Garden of Eden story. And they were given this paradise-type existence. They were walking around without any clothes on. Sounds great, right? You're having a great time. Anything that you see that you want to eat, you can eat, except for one tree. There's one tree that has this fruit that looks good. And God has said, listen, everything else, all the grapes, the peaches, the oranges, all that kind of stuff. You can have all of that. Eat as much of it as you want. There's going to be probably stuff with nuts and bananas. You name it. It's there. Watermelon on the ground. Have it. There's that one tree. Don't do it. And, and you and I look at it and go, man, how did they do that? Why couldn't they just do it? And then you also realize if you have kids, like all you have to do is give them one rule if you want to break a rule. I mean, you don't have to give a kid ten rules and say, hey, take a pick. Like give a kid one rule. They're going to break it. It's just part of who we are. That's part of our, our nature, unfortunately. And that's exactly what happened. And so God gave them one rule. And as we read in verse 6 of chapter 3, it says, The woman saw that the tree, the one tree, was good for food. It was delightful to look at. It was desirable for obtaining wisdom. It was the trifecta of alluring, right? So she took some of its fruit and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband Adam, who was with her, and he ate it. The one thing they were told not to do, they did. They faced temptation, and they gave into temptation. Well, you know that what comes right after this story is that they were hiding from God. Because they were in a relationship with God, the physical presence. And he's walking through the garden, and they realized that they had broken that one rule. And so they were hiding from him. But when he finally found them and confronted them, it went like this. He said to Adam, Adam, what happened? Why, what did this happen? And of course, he blamed Eve. He's like, oh, the woman! Right? I try that all the time, by the way. Nathan, why, the woman! Right? Either my daughter or my wife. i got two to choose from, you know? We need more women on staff so I can blame more people. You know? I mean, that's just what we need. But that was what Adam said. It was Eve. She's the one that made me do it. So Adam looks at Eve and says, Eve, why did you do it? It was the snake, the serpent, the devil. The devil made me do it. It's an excuse as old as humanity. The problem with simply saying the devil made me do it is that it doesn't do us any good. See, I believe temptation is rooted in evil. I truly believe that. And I believe that evil is, is rooted or originates with Satan. The angel that was kicked out of heaven because he rebelled against God. He wanted God's authority. He wanted God's throne. And God said, you can't have that. You're not me. And so he was relegated to earth to cause destruction and disarray and, and confusion and all of the things that he continues to do as the father of lies. But simply saying that every mistake we've made was because the devil made us do it doesn't serve us well. We've got to move beyond that. We've got to recognize our part in that and also come up with a strategy to face temptation, whether it's direct temptation of the devil or just the temptation of the culture around us or the temptation that comes from that nature inside of us so that we can face it and say no. It doesn't do us any good. It's never going to heal the, the things that have been broken. It's never going to fix the things that have been made wrong. It's never going to, to take away the bad experiences or the negative consequences. And so we need help to deal with and overcome temptation. And if you'll go with me for a little bit this morning, I think what you'll find is that Jesus offers this help. In fact, in Hebrews, the writer says, For since he himself has suffered when he was tempted, talking about Jesus, he is able to help those who are tempted. The Bible promises that Jesus can be a help to those of us who want assistance in facing temptation and overcoming temptation. But it's also because Jesus has the experience of being human and winning the battle against temptation that he can be a help. You see, Jesus was fully God, but he was also fully human. He experienced all of the ups and downs of the human experience that you and I experienced. The physical ups and downs, the pain, the elation, the emotional ups and downs, what it's like to be rejected, what it's like to be accepted, loved, hated, all of those things Jesus went through. And so he's able to help us face temptation because he faced it himself. Again, in Hebrews, it says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. He's not able to say, hey, listen, I don't get what you're going through. But we have one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Now, this idea that Jesus was a sinless man, that he was a full human living all of the things that we live, having all this experience, and yet never gave in to sin, never gave in to temptation and crossed that line to sin, that's hard for some people to believe. In fact, I found out a couple weeks ago, I was reading through an article in a, in a Christian magazine, that over 40% of American Christians don't believe that Jesus lived a sinless life. They actually believe Jesus sinned. And, and, and my thought in that is like, well, either they don't 
they've never been taught what the Bible teaches about that, or, or they don't believe what the Bible has to say about that. Listen, the fact that Jesus lived a sinless life is a pretty important piece of the Christian faith. And let me explain, okay? For Jesus' death on the cross to count as a payment for our sin, he had to be a perfect sacrifice, which means only a sinless human could take on the sin of all of our sinful uh, problems and all of our lives and pay the price for our debt. It, it wasn't just that he was better than the rest of us. He was entirely different than the rest of us. Having gone through everything we went through, having faced everything we faced, and yet come out victorious, he was that perfect lamb, that perfect sacrifice. The fact that Jesus was sinless is significant. And if it's still hard for you to believe, I hope that you'll continue to come along with us on this journey because we're going to look at a story in Scripture where Jesus faced temptation head on. And we're going to see how he responded and how he overcame. And I think in this we'll find hope that we might have an ability to do the exact same thing if we take a play out of his playbook. All right. And so we're going to look today uh, at Luke chapter 4. And we're going to start with the very first temptation that Jesus faced in the wilderness there, starting in verse 1. It says, Then Jesus left the Jordan, full of the Holy Spirit, and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for forty days to be tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and when they were over, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are, not the, if you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, It is written, Man must not live on bread alone. So a couple things as we go back to this. I just want to give you some, some context for where this story happens um, in the gospel, in the, in the life of Jesus. Um, Jesus' baptism at the Jordan River occurred sometime around his 30th birthday, or so we believe. It was, it was in his adult years, okay? Up to that point, he had lived a pretty much normal life. We have the one scene from the temple when he and his parents, when he was probably a 12-year-old or maybe an early teen, and they had gone to the synagogue, and, and he had stayed behind when they had gone back with the caravan. That's the only insight other than Jesus' birth that we have into his life whatsoever. And so his ministry, really him kind of coming out as the Son of God, all of the miracles, all of the teaching, the things that he did, all of that happened after his baptism. So his baptism was that experience that launched him into his full identity as the Son of God and launched him into his ministry as the Savior of the world. And that's what took place in chapter 3, right before we get to this in chapter 4. In his baptism, Jesus goes to the Jordan River, and his cousin, John the Baptist, who's preaching this message of repentance, telling people they, get to need, they need to get their lives back together, baptizing them in the name of repentance, saying, hey, this is a, a symbol of you kind of being uh, repentant and being forgiven, and so they, they're having this baptism. Jesus comes to the Jordan and says, I want you to baptize me. To which John responds, I'm not worthy to baptize you. He recognizes who Jesus is, but Jesus says, no, I want you to do this. It needs to happen this way. And so that's what happened. John the Baptist baptizes Jesus in the Jordan River, and all of the stories from the Gospels with the baptism tell this, that when he comes up out of the Jordan, out of the river, and comes back onto the land, two things happen. One, uh, the Spirit of God that looks like a dove coming down from heaven comes and rests upon Jesus. So he is now full of the Spirit. The Spirit is on him. But in addition to this physical representation of the Spirit kind of embodying Jesus, you also have this voice that is heard, and the voice says, This is my Son with whom I am pleased. The voice of God announcing the, the identity of His Son, Jesus Christ, at His baptism. That's why we talk about Jesus going public into His identity as the Son of God and the Savior of the world in His baptism. So that's what happened right before this story. So it says He left the Jordan, where He was just baptized, full of the Holy Spirit, right? That's what it just come down on. And he was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. But we also understand why the devil tempts him this way. If you are the Son of God, remember that was what God had just called him. You are my Son with whom I am pleased. So let's kind of get into this a little bit more verse by verse. The first two verses say, when he left the Jordan full of the Holy Spirit, he was led by the Spirit, okay? So he was surrendered to the leadership of the Holy Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted. So the first thing you need to know is that this whole scene of Jesus facing the devil, good versus evil, this whole thing was ordained and planned by God. God needed Jesus to go head to head with Satan. And as you kind of read through the New Testament, what you actually see is that this is the first of three epic battles between good and evil. The first of three epic battles between Jesus 
and the devil, the Messiah and Savior of the world, and the father of lies and all that is evil. If you're into kind of like trilogy movies, consider this like the Matrix 1, right? Before 2 and 3 came out, and then 4 ruined the whole thing, so don't even worry about that. Or like Star Wars, before they added all the extra movies. You know, like this is part 1 of the trilogy. Part 2, we see in the resurrection. When he comes back to life, overcoming sin and death, he puts Satan in his place. In part three, we read about in Revelation, where the serpent is ultimately killed forever and destroyed forever. So this is part one. But God needed him to face the devil straight on and overcome that to prove that he was not like every other man. He was different than every other man. So ordained by God to be tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. So he was fasting. Right? He was relying on the sustenance of God, his relationship with God to provide all the things that he needed. And when those days were over, get this, you don't eat for 40 days, he was hungry. Right? A very real experience, a very real feeling, a very human experience, just like you or I might feel if we go a meal or two without eating. And so that is where we find Jesus when the devil starts to tempt him. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, like that announcement that was just made at the Jordan says, if you really are, then you've got the power to tell this stone to become bread. You're hungry. You've got the power. You're the son of God, which means you have the power of God. Why don't you turn this stone into bread? God has a history of turning all sorts of things into different things. If you're really God, then you can do that too. You know what you need. You have the power. You should do it. And I think if we stop here, we might identify with this and recognize that this is the exact same kind of temptation that God, unfortunately, allows us to face. Okay, I'm not going to say he leads us into this in the same way that he has with Jesus, but he allows us to face this. He doesn't allow us to face it unequipped, however. These are the same kind of temptations that we face in our life when the combination of evil outside, the world around, and the nature within kind of come together and entice us to do things to satisfy our flesh, to satisfy our desires, our emotions, and our feelings. We, we, we start to, to, to hear these things like, man, that looks good. You deserve that. You can afford that. Listen, nobody's going to know if you do that. Those are all temptations that I identify with. I don't, I don't know if that's things that, that you've heard, those voices, or things that you identify with as well. But when, when, when I'm being tempted to do something that I know I shouldn't do, a lot of times it's those lies of saying, you deserve it, you can afford it. You have the power to do this. No one's going to find out. Those can be some of the most convincing arguments to allow me to cross that line from temptation to sin. See, being tempted isn't a sin. It's when we give in to that temptation that we've crossed that line outside of God's purpose for our life. And so there are two questions kind of at the core of this type of, um, of temptation. If this is a temptation of the flesh, then those two questions are this. What role do I want my feelings, cravings, and desires to play in my life? And to whom or where do I look to satisfy these things? Right? What role do I want my feelings, cravings, and desires to play in my life? Do I want my feelings, cravings, and desires to drive all of my decisions in the world? Do I simply want to be held slave or captive to the things that I feel? Right? Do I want every choice, every decision I make, every, 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 every hard choice that I make just go, well, how do I feel? I guess I should go with how I feel. If that's the case, I think you're going to live a miserable life. If that's what you choose to do, I think it will be an absolute miserable life experience for you. I truly believe that. I believe that our needs and our feelings were intended and given to us to inform us or reveal things to us about ourselves. I mean, think about this as a basic example. If you feel hungry, that's your body telling you, you probably need some food. If you feel tired, that's your body's way of informing you or telling you, you could use some rest right? These are things that inform your decisions, but we should never let them make our decisions, right? If I let my feeling of hunger and my preferences for food drive all of my decisions, I would be the size of a house. And the reason for that is because I happen to think that the best fast food out there in the world is McDonald's Big Mac and fries, okay? I know some of you disagree, and you're wrong, but that's okay. I'm glad that there is grace enough in Grace City Church that we can have different opinions on that. But I love a Big Mac, okay? Whether it's the special sauce or the tiny little pieces of meat that they count as, as you know, as, as patties or whatever. I just love a Big Mac. And I allow myself one Big Mac a month. That's what I allow myself right now. Because otherwise, there will come a day when my headstone says, here lies Nathan Bryant. He really loved the Big Mac. That is how much I love that food. 
But if I let my hunger and my preferences and my feelings drive all of my food choices, that would not be a good thing. The same thing is true for all of our deeper needs and our deeper desires. If I let my feeling of loneliness drive me to the first community that accepts me, who knows if that's going to work out? I mean, if it's a great community, like maybe a church community, that could be a positive thing. But as a youth pastor, I've seen time and time again students who are left out and feeling lonely and don't feel like they have a place to connect, embraced by a community of kids. And I'm like, oh, God, that is not going to go well. And it doesn't. But see, when you're 14, you don't, you don't have the wisdom or, or the maturity to understand that, that my feelings shouldn't drive my decision. Because you are lonely. You are, in fact, feeling rejected. You are, in fact, feeling hungry. You are, in fact, feeling overwhelmed. You need a release. You need an escape. And rather than letting it inform your decision and let it be part of your decision process, you just let it drive your decision. The most dangerous forms of temptation start with legitimate desires that you have, feelings, emotions, cravings that God has given you to inform you and reveal things to you about yourself. But those temptations offer illegitimate forms of satisfaction for those legitimate desires and feelings that you have. And when you mix those two things, you get into all sorts of trouble. In verse 4, we read that Jesus answered him, it is written, man must not live on bread alone. You see, that second question right there was, to whom or where do I look to satisfy these things? I'm hungry. Where should I look? I just told you, I shouldn't look to McDonald's every time. I should look other places right? I should look for healthier options. Maybe I shouldn't eat every time I'm hungry. Like, that might be a really good decision to make. But when you're feeling the things that you feel, when you're going through the things that you go through, where do you look to satisfy? Where do you look to fill yourself up? Where do you look for that release from an overwhelming situation? Because there are healthy ways to deal with that, and there are unhealthy ways to deal with that. And so Jesus says, man must not live on bread alone. And what he's doing here is he's quoting a passage from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Okay? And the story that we find in Deuteronomy chapter 8 is Moses leading the Israelites as they're wandering around in the wilderness. Get that, the wilderness, just the same place where Jesus is. There's all sorts of ties, and we'll get to that through the course of this series. But what he's saying here, he goes, listen, God has already made it very clear from very early on that like just physical sustenance, that just material things, that just feeling good in the moment, that isn't enough to live. I, you may be able to exist going from one meal to another, or from one experience to another, one vacation to another, one illicit affair to another. Like You can exist, but you will never truly live. You will never truly thrive. You will not avoid the pitfalls of life doing it that way. To truly live, you need to be satisfied or filled up by God. God has a deeper reservoir of things that can fill you up. Those things that you chase that satisfaction in, they will give you a taste. That's why they're so enticing, because they're, they do feel good in the moment. They do feel good for just a little while, but ultimately they leave you wanting more, or they leave you feeling regretful, or they, feel, they leave you just, just, just feeling just miserable. And God is... God is using Jesus to remind Satan, hey, listen, bread alone isn't what we live on. Uh, satisfying our, our, our momentary craving isn't what life is all about. God is going to provide for my needs, both my physical needs, my material needs, and my deeper needs. And so he's quoting scripture here, a truth of scripture that he believes, that he knows to be true in the face of that enticing offer. And get it, Jesus was really hungry. He was actually hungry. It wasn't that Jesus was, oh, he's God, he's not really hungry. No, he was legitimately hungry. He was human. But he said, there was something that I value more than satisfying my hunger, and that is to find fulfillment in my relationship with God. Okay? He valued God's truth and God's purpose for his life more than he valued satisfying a craving. Uh, this is a beautiful reminder of why we should read Scripture. You know, I mean, I, I think that you could memorize the entire Bible— and still have a need to continue reading the Bible. You know, like that story in Deuteronomy, you know, 8-3, like the story of Moses leading the Israelites through the wilderness. I, I'm not sure how many times I've read it, but I know almost every, every part of that story, seemingly, like all the, the details and everything. But we read those stories to remind ourselves of these truths so that in the face of temptation, we are armed and equipped to respond with truth, a truth that is more compelling than that offer is enticing. 
We have to have a why that is compelling, and we'll get to that in just a little bit. So what do we do with this? What do we do with Jesus' response? What do we do with Jesus' ordained battle against Devin, and how do we apply this? I believe that we can take from from Jesus' approach and several other passages of Scripture a game plan of sorts in how we might face temptation and see victory in the face of it. And it starts with kind of a three-pronged approach. The first thing is, I think we need to identify our most dangerous cravings. Jesus knew that in the moment, he was hungry. That was the overwhelming feeling, craving, desire physically in the moment that he had. And I think that if we're going to get good at facing temptation and overcoming temptation, we have to be honest about the things that tempt us the most. Which means we're going to have to create a list of the things that if we were to give in, we kind of know what they are. And if you have a hard time coming up with that list, just ask somebody who knows you really well. Because they'll tell you, listen, you've never done this before, but it wouldn't be surprise me if somebody made you a good enough offer that you would do that one thing. So create a list. Be honest. Again, you don't have to share it, but create a list. The second thing is to start fighting now. And I think there's, we're going to get to this a little bit more next week. But in fighting now, the first thing to fight temptation is to avoid it altogether. I mean, there are so many times that we walk ourselves right into temptation. We know we're going to face it, you know, and yet we walk right into it. Like, this is, this is the beautiful thing about, um, like, the recovery ministry and, like, 12-step programs and things. I've got countless friends who, you know, have been sober for many years, and they'll talk about, like, the importance of accountability and the importance of the meeting and the importance of the sponsor. And it's like you need those people in your life saying, listen, you're an alcoholic. Stop going to places where they serve alcohol. Like, that's just so important. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to require you to make decisions about the places you go and maybe the people that you're around. Sometimes very difficult decisions, but you've got to decide. Do I want my life to be better, and do I want to better the lives of other people around me? Or do I want to keep putting myself in the fire of facing temptation over and over and over again? I know that I can't say no if the offer is too good. So start fighting now. So you avoid it. You share that list of your most dangerous cravings with somebody else. And the last thing you do, I believe, is you start, you start thinking about what is my response going to be? What is that truth that is more compelling? And that's, of course, number three. You've got to determine and commit to your why. You're going to have to have something in your life that is more compelling than that offer of temptation is enticing. You're going to have to have something that you believe in more strongly than the temptation is to to cross over that line, right? There's going to have to be something more compelling than your reason. And and when it comes to to, to a why, I think when you start to develop your why, we're, we're all going to start in a different place. For a lot of people, I think immediately what comes to our mind is my family. My family's my why. I'm not going to cross that line of temptation into sin because I realize that if I did that, I might be sacrificing my family. It might blow my family up, and I love my family too much. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your reputation. Maybe it's your future. And listen, I'm not saying that any of those whys are bad. I actually think those are all great whys in and of themselves. But I've been a pastor long enough, and I've been alive long enough to know that there are some amazing men and women who love their family and love their spouse and love their job, love their reputation, love their, the idea of what their future held, and they still gave in to temptation. That wasn't a compelling enough why. And I don't think it's because they didn't love them. I just don't know that that's a strong enough why. And so if you're not a believer in a God who created you and a God who loves you, this may be a challenge. But this is also an opportunity to enter into a relationship with God that the Bible says did in fact create you and does in fact love you. Because with creating you and with loving you, God has given you a purpose. He has placed in you a unique identity. He has put you on a mission. And I think when Jesus said no, he said no because he recognized that his identity that was found in his father, the purpose that God had given and the mission that he was sent to earth to accomplish, all of those things were more important more compelling and more significant than his hunger in that moment. And I wonder, I wonder what it would be like if we were to find our own purpose more compelling than the needs, cravings, and desires of any given moment. He said no because sinning would have taken him off course. Sinning would have disqualified him from being the perfect sacrifice. He said no for you and for me. His why is sitting in this room. His why is living in this neighborhood. His why is walking the streets of this earth. 
He said no because he realized there would be generations of people who needed a savior so they could have a relationship with the God who loves them. And to say yes to turning stones into bread would have crossed the line to sin and he would have been disqualified from ever paying the price on the cross. That's a pretty compelling why. I think we're going to have to find a compelling why in our identity, in our purpose, and our mission as well. You see, listen, life is sacrifice. A life well lived requires sacrifice, but all life is a sacrifice. You either sacrifice the things in the fa- you're feeling this moment for the things that mean more later, or you sacrifice those things that are going to happen later so that you can have those things in the moment. This is what it means to be tempted. This is what it means to be human in some extent. But what if you came to believe that your purpose is more important and more significant than the things that you really want and the things that really look good right now? This week, I want to give you a challenge. This is a three-part challenge, but this is one week, and we're going to start with number one on identifying your most dangerous craving. This week, I want you to do uh, three things. I want you to find one meal this week that you normally eat, and I want you to fast. So go without Okay, now if you never eat breakfast, you don't get to fast from breakfast, all right? Fasting means going without, all right? So if it's Thursday's lunch at the country club, you're not having Thursday's lunch at the country club. Find a meal that you really like, that you really look forward to every week. Maybe it's your McDonald's, all right? I'm not judging, but go without a meal. That's going to do two things. One, it's going to give you the experience of just a taste of the experience that Jesus went through. 40 days, no food. I'm not asking you to do that, right? But one meal, no food. Now, Don't replace that with something else. Don't work through your lunch break. What I'm asking you to do instead of eating while you're fasting is to create a list. So get your phone out, okay? Get your Bible out. Read this story, Luke chapter 4, the first in 12 verses, and create a list of your own. These are the things that if I'm honest with myself, no one else has to see it. God's watching me type it. God's watching me write it. But it's just between me and him. These are the things that I struggle with. Like I've been binge watching a show, you know, like, and I don't know, God, but like I, that just, it, 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 there's so much violence, it makes me angry, and I'm tempted to be, you know, more angry than I should be. And it, I, I don't like the person I've become. And so I, I realize before I get to the anger that, that's, that's, that's leveled against my family or my, my work people or whatever, I, I just need to stop watching that show. Or maybe you recognize that, that social media is kind of this rabbit hole that leads you to looking at things on your phone or your device that you shouldn't be looking at. And you don't feel good about it. You know you shouldn't do it, but next thing you know, you're looking at it again. You're like, God, why did I do this again? Write it down. Maybe you recognize that you shouldn't be the treasurer of your kid's school club or, or sports team because, you know, every once in a while, when, when things get hard, skimming a little bit off the top doesn't sound so bad. Nobody's going to find out. You're the treasurer. How would anybody find out? Write it down. When nobody's around, or maybe when I put the kids to bed and I've had a really tiring day, I just want to pour myself an extra large glass of wine. Write it down. These are the things that if it was enticing enough, is if I was weak enough, I know I would give in to them. Write them down. Put them on a piece of paper. So you take one meal and you fast. You write one list. And then with that list, I want you to say one prayer. And that prayer is this. God, you know me. You know I am tempted by these things. I don't want to give in to them, so I'm asking you to help me. Remind me now, and in the moments I am tempted, of how much you love me and of your purpose for my life. Amen. You don't have to share that list with anybody. As soon as you type it on your phone, you delete it. As soon as you write it on a pad of paper, tear it up and throw it away. But write that list and pray this prayer. And I believe if you do that, one meal, one list, one prayer then each and every one of us would be one step closer to living a life that is not controlled by our cravings, a life that is better for us and betters the lives of the people that we love the most. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to look um, at a story of just this epic battle of good and evil. God, where, where Jesus was led to the wilderness for this, this showdown where he could reverse uh, just the history of, of man's falling to temptation, God. You, you, tempted the, you allowed the first sinless man to be tempted by the snake, and unfortunately he gave in to that temptation. And so, God, when Jesus came into his identity as the Son of God, you led him into the wilderness to reverse that, to undo that in a way. 
God, to prove that good does overcome evil, that there is a way that we can face temptation, square in the face, and say no. God, you have, because you've been tempted, because you've suffered, you can help us. So God, that's what we're asking you to do. We cannot do this on our own strength, God. There isn't a why in our own lives that is compelling enough to say no each and every time that we're tempted to do something we know we shouldn't. So Lord, remind us of your love for us. Remind us of your purpose in our life. Remind us that we have a mission. And God, that you love us in spite. God, we thank you for your forgiveness when we get it wrong. We pray, Lord, that with your strength and with your guidance, we make it better in this area of our life. In Jesus' name I pray.